So on this All Saints Sunday, I've been thinking all week about one of the saints of my life, my beloved preaching professor and mentor, Joey Jeter. Dr. Jeter is still among the living saints of the world. But the last time I saw him, this great prophet of the gospel held my hand in an airport and said, I've given my life to all the words, and they now fail me. Saints of our life are to be people, I think, for maybe at least us non-Catholic folks. Saints are the ones we look to to draw inspiration. People who encourage us, people who, want, who make us want to be better and more faithful to God and to who God is calling each of us and all of us to be. And we only have about 15 minutes, so I'll just tell you one Joey story. This week, he, I've been thinking about the time he told me about his very first call, his very first church, which was to the church that had ordained him, his home church in Fort Worth, the same church that would just a couple weeks later would ordain me. And when Joey was called to be the associate minister at Old First Christian Church in downtown Fort Worth, Fort Worth was in the middle of navigating desegregation in its schools. And this old historic church was found itself right smack dab in the middle of it. Now, what you need to know about this young, wide-eyed associate minister that this old church had called was that midway through his time at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, Dr. Jeter had been inspired by another great prophet of the gospel, some guy named King who was working in Montgomery, Alabama. And Dr. Jeter in his words, it's somewhat urban legend now, walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and got on a bus and went to Montgomery. And so this young prophet of the gospel began to take on his own people, his own congregation in his old home church, and he challenged the ordinary people of his beloved community he challenged them about their worship of racism and oppression and all the ways that they had allowed and succumbed to the world's twisting of the gospel, the twisting of the ways of God. And he challenged them by reminding them how much easier it was when you just fall in line and you don't rock the boat too much. Now, this seems to me not unlike this story of Elijah. Elijah is one of the saints of the Hebrew Scriptures, and he, in his time, challenges his own ordinary folks of his beloved community to stand up for the ways of God. And he asked them, like I think Dr. Jeter did, he asked them to consider what it really means to be people of faith in a world that makes it really hard to be people of faith, working really hard to live out the gospel. Sometimes it seems the more things change, perhaps the more they stay the same. Ancient prophets like Elijah were really unpopular with their own people, and so we're going to look at them over the next four weeks. This prophet, Elijah, 
is sent to be a thorn in the side of the king. Ahab had married a foreign woman named Jezebel. Now, time out. This is not a sermon about Jezebel. Okay? Not a sermon about Jezebel or the urban legend that she has become in the modern day. So stay focused. Stay with me here. The problem with the queen, Jezebel, was that she was vehemently faithful to the gods of her heritage and her ancestors, and she worshipped Baal. Now, so we can stay focused, let's just say that Baal was very popular. And Ahab, allowing his new bride to bring this Baal into even greater popularity in Israel and into the Israelite culture, and to take over sort of as the god of the country, it was a problem. You may remember that they were had already been given this little thing called the Ten Commandments, right? And what's the first of the Ten Commandments? Thank you. Idolatry. What are you worshiping? The very first one is, you will have no other gods before me, not even the god of the queen. And to make matters worse, old Jezebel, she began to kill all the prophets of Yahweh. All the buddies of Elijah. So the people loyal to Yahweh began to hide all these prophets to keep them safe. And so when Elijah shows up to confront Ahab about his lack of leadership, let's say, and his lack of faithfulness, to the God Yahweh, you can imagine how unexcited Ahab was to see him. And you know, I was really interested as I was rereading this scripture this week, because as you read it carefully, you notice Elijah doesn't focus on on Ahab or Jezebel, those with big power. He turns all of his attention to the ordinary Israelite people. Now, one might imagine some woman preacher who wears a stiletto, who gets herself all worked up about things, to get right up in the face of old Ahab and really take her finger and give him what for, right? Not Elijah, no. Elijah doesn't even see Jezebel, he takes his situation straight to the people. And so he has Ahab gather all of Israel to be assembled for a big showdown, a duel at the OK Corral between Yahweh and Baal. And he says to them, and I love how Gene Peterson paraphrases this, he says, listen, fence sitters, Get off the fence. You can't have your cake and eat it too, to mix our metaphors. You either have to be all in with Yahweh or all in with Baal and the queen. No middle ground. All or nothing. Now this all or nothing attitude is a problem. It seems this becomes destructive. It becomes dangerous. It becomes seductive, perhaps, since we got Jezebel in the story. And so after Elijah wins this duel with his opponents, he murders every last one of these prophets. And you were probably looking at the screen, but when they were reading it, I happened to be looking at the choir. And when Ryan read that about murdering all the prophets, they all kind of went, whoa. He murders every last one of them. And I thought to myself, Elijah and Jezebel are more alike than they are different, perhaps, when we're not careful. 
crazy, murderous extremists who bully and kill to get their own way. And I'm not sure what Elijah thought was going to happen after murdering all of Jezebel's guys. But to no one's surprise, Jezebel was kind of angry, and so she places a hit out on Elijah. And so Elijah, naturally, takes off. Elijah seems to be over it. He's done. He's fed up with the secular culture and the people's succumbing to it. His people, his community, have abandoned their covenant. They have abandoned the path of faithfulness walked by their ancestors. And perhaps somewhere way down deep, Elijah realizes he too has allowed this destructive, seductive ways into his own life. He realizes that he too has fallen in to the ways of the culture instead of Yahweh. And so, Elijah decides it's easier just to give up. He says to God, I can't do this. I feel all alone. I am alone, oh God. I give up. And God, God says in this story, not once, but twice, We hear the voice of God say, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been working my heart out for you, O God, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Then he was told, Go, stand on the mountain at attention before God. God will pass by. A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God. But God wasn't to be found in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle and quiet whisper. When Elijah heard the quiet voice, he muffled his face with his great cloak, went to the mouth of the cave and stood there. A quiet voice asked, So Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? Elijah said it again. I've been working my heart out for God because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. God said, go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. Meanwhile, I'm preserving for myself 7,000 souls, the knees that haven't bowed to the God but all the mouths that haven't kissed his image. That little section is probably the most popular of 1 Kings. And if you know anything about 1 Kings or about Elijah, you probably know about his flying chariot and about that story right there. And I realized this week, most of us, well, church folks anyway, know or have heard this story about, no, God doesn't come in wind, and God doesn't come in earthquake. God comes in this still, quiet voice. And I realize this week, we get all caught up in about how God speaks, and how God shows up or doesn't. And as a result, we miss the point of the story because we forget what it is God says to Elijah. After asking not once but twice, of God's servant, God says, what are you doing here? And Elijah, in his little paid party, says, well, it's hard, and it's lonely, and everybody against me. 
and the mess is too deep, and the cost is too high, and the queen, she has so much power, and she's so evil. And it's as if God says to Elijah, yeah, tell me about it. Now tell me anything I don't know. It's a hot mess. And that's why I need you to get yourself up out of this cave and go see what you can do about it. And you're not alone. There are 7,000 people out there waiting on someone to walk alongside and help lead them, waiting on someone to come and help lead them in the ways of Yahweh. And here you are, holed up in this cave. What are you doing here, Elijah? And finally... Elijah does, as he is told, even though what he had asked for in his prayers didn't come to be. It was not what he wanted. He got up, and for a few more chapters anyway, he goes back to work. And on this All Saints Sunday, I wonder what this ancient prophet has still to say to modern peoples. How might this saint of the faith inspire you this day? Elijah reminds me that oftentimes the saints are the ones who keep at it, who are invested even sometimes when it's dangerous and unpopular and against all the odds or the polls, even when they make mistakes and maybe even make the situation worse. The saints are the ones who keep at it when they want to quit and they throw in the towel and then have to go get the towel out of the laundry basket later. Even when the power of the wind and the rain and even the quiet doesn't convince them, even when they run away and try to give up, even when they don't get their own way, Elijah reminds me that it's so much easier to say yes to being a saint. It's so much easier to say I'm in when the outside world looks and sounds and feels a whole lot like you, it's a whole lot easier to say I'm in when the sun is shining and Baal isn't so popular or so powerful. It seems to me this morning that our city and our world perhaps need a few more courageous saints. And I wonder on this All Saints Sunday, it is my prayer. It is my prayer for us that Elijah might inspire each of us to consider what cave God shows up to find us hiding in. And how will we respond when we hear the voice of God say, what are you doing here? May it be so. May it be so for us.